Last week we talked on the subject of connecting into the power. And we pointed out how that basically, in order to connect into the power, it involves the enthronement of the Spirit in our lives. The enthronement of the Spirit in our lives involves the dethronement of self. And so it is when I step off the throne and I say, now Lord, I want You to be on the throne of my life. I want You to direct my activity." It is then that the Holy Spirit begins to empower me. Tonight we would like to talk to you about some of the effects that you're going to experience as you enter into that overflowing power of the Spirit in your life. In the seventh chapter of John, on the last day, the great day of the feast, when Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that drinketh of the water that I give, as the Scripture saith, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That word flow there in the Greek is literally gush. Torrents of living water. Talking about a flood. That flooding of the Spirit of God over our lives, over our souls. The results of the unrestrained working of the Spirit in my life. What will it be? First of all, There are some misconceptions, I think, concerning what the Holy Spirit is going to do in my life. We so often look at persons like Billy Graham, who has been called and anointed by the Holy Spirit to be an evangelist in the body of Christ. And we say, my, isn't that marvelous what the Spirit of God will do through a man's life. And I begin to think that if I could only yield enough to the Spirit, I could be another Billy Graham. I could have thousands of people jamming into Anaheim Stadium. And I could speak to them through the anointing of the Spirit and thousands would respond and come forward. And we're prone to think that the Holy Spirit always manifests Himself in gigantic evangelism like Billy Graham. But interestingly enough, over in the book of Exodus, we read where the Holy Spirit came upon uh, this man by the name of Basilel. And the effect of the Holy Spirit upon his life was giving him Great ability in craftsmanship. Skill as a carpenter. As a mason. And in the weaving of fine fabrics. And so the anointing of the Spirit upon his life was not manifested in evangelism, but in great skill in doing his job. Again we read in the book of Exodus where the Holy Spirit came upon 70 of the elders of Israel and the effect of the Holy Spirit in their life was great administrative abilities in order that they might help Moses oversee the great number of people. In the the New Testament we find that the Holy Spirit came upon Elizabeth to help her to be a better mother for her son John the Baptist. 
so that we read in 1 Corinthians 12 that though there are diversities of gifts of the Spirit, there are also the diversities of operations of the Spirit. And so we cannot look at a pattern, we cannot look what the Spirit has done in one man's life and say, well, that's what's going to happen in me when the Holy Spirit really has full control. Chances are he won't make you a Billy Graham. But he will refine the skills that you have. He will help you to be a better person in that area where you are. The second mistake that we often make concerning the power of the Holy Spirit is that we think that we will always be successful in everything we endeavor for the Lord. After all, if the Spirit is in it, it's going to be successful. We're going to see positive results for our ministry because now we are being led of the Spirit. Isaiah, a prophet of God, filled with the Spirit, anointed by God, preached for years with very little success. No real fruit to his ministry. The same was true with Jeremiah. In fact, his anointed ministry brought personal peril to his life. He was thrown in the dungeon and they were going to kill him. So, having the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit does not mean and does not guarantee that my every endeavor for the Lord is going to be met with overwhelming success. You see, we often have a tendency to get discouraged when we don't see the results that we're desiring. But God has called some people to water. God has called some people to plant. And we are not all called to the same ministry. And you may not see the fruit or the results of the working of the Spirit in your life, such as Billy Graham who has been called to reap. But you cannot reap unless there is first of all a planting and a watering. And he that planteth is nothing and he that watereth is nothing it is all the unified work of the Spirit working through our various talents and gifts and capacities and the whole success and results. The glory goes to the Lord, not to the individual who just threw out the last net and drew them in. So don't anticipate phenomenal success in your evangelistic endeavors for the Lord now that you've been filled with the Spirit. Jesus' life in the Spirit brought him to the cross. Stephen's Spirit-anointed message brought him a hail of stones. Now, the purpose of the empowering of the Holy Spirit in my life is ultimately to conform me into the image of Jesus Christ to make me like Him. You see, when God first created man, God created man in His image and in His likeness. That is God's ultimate intention for man. That man live in the image of God and in the likeness of God so that in that image and likeness he might have close communion and fellowship with God. But through sin, man fell from the image of God. 
He fell from the likeness of God. You can no longer understand God by looking at man. And so the purpose of God sending to us the power of the Holy Spirit is to restore unto that, unto us that image of God that we lost through sin and through the fall. To restore us into the likeness of God to make me like Jesus Christ. Now, this being made into the likeness of Jesus Christ is first manifested in a transfigured life. My life has changed. And the first consciousness of this is a deep inner peace. That peace of God in my heart that passes human understanding. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. The first effect of the working of the Spirit in my life is that of peace. It's that of rest. It's a peace that I don't even understand myself. I feel it. You do not have to understand it to have it. It's a peace that comes from just knowing that God is in control of my life and everything is going to work out all right because God's in control. It's the kind of peace that allows me to sleep when it seems the ship is sinking. like my Lord. That deep inner peace. I don't get upset over situations that aren't quite to my liking. I don't get all angry and disturbed and stirred up over these little irritating things. I just know God's in control. He's going to take care of beautiful peace that passes human understanding. With that, there also comes a deep yearning in my heart to please God. It becomes really the master passion of my life. I devote myself to pleasing Him. I measure things now not by is it right or is it wrong, But I measure them by, is it pleasing to my Father? Would He be pleased with me if I did this? Would this be displeasing to Him? And the passion of my heart and life is to please the Father. Like Jesus, again, for He's conforming me into the image of Christ. Like Jesus who said, I do always those things that please the Father. That becomes really an obsession in my own life. To always do those things that please the Father. I also find with this inner transformation the desire to talk very often with my Lord. I find myself looking forward to those times that I just spend alone with Him in that beautiful, intimate fellowship in prayer. Listening to Him, talking to Him, sharing with Him, opening up my heart and the innermost areas of my heart to Him as I pour out to Him my soul, my thoughts, my love. And allow Him to just pour into me His heart, His soul, His love. And I find myself desiring, longing for these moments together with Him. I also find that praises 
seemed to rise spontaneously from my heart unto him. Praise the Lord becomes a very common kind of a phrase with me. Or, oh, bless the Lord. Oh, God is good. And, and just it, it's just spontaneous as I see the work of God and as I experience the love of the Lord in my life. And I look around on His glory and His beauty and I find myself just praising Him for that goodness, for that love. Now with this though, I also find that my temptations have become much greater. You see, the establishing of the Lord on the throne of my life also means the replacing of Satan from the place of ruling and he doesn't like being dethroned. And so he is seeking to come back onto the throne and he starts throwing greater temptations into my path. He begins to assail me. And I find that the temptations actually become greater, not lesser, but stronger. But I also find with the temptations, there comes also a greater power to overcome the temptations so that my victories are greater victories. So you will be tempted. Satan will see to that. But you will have victory over the temptations. Jesus will see to that. You should never underestimate the power of the enemy. You can never overestimate the power of Jesus working in your life. With this transformed life, there comes a new feeling and sensitivity towards sin. I find that I have a greater hatred of it. I find that I have a longing, a longing to be pure in heart. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And I desire that purity. God, make me pure. I begin to develop a real hatred of sin. For I can see what sin does as far as my relationship and fellowship with God. It takes me away from the one I love. I learned to hate it. And then I find that there is an intense desire that others might come to know my Master. That they might know that same joy and peace and blessing that I've experienced by walking with Him. And so I find myself sharing with others concerning my Lord. Oh, it's not some program that I follow. It's just something natural. He so absorbs my life, I really have nothing else worthwhile to talk about. And so I cannot be long in conversation with anybody without bringing Him up and sharing Him. And I have this intense desire to share my Lord with others. there also comes into my life an all-inclusive love. The love of God begins to flood over my life through the Spirit that He has given to me. Paul said that in Romans chapter 5. And it makes me compassionate 
compassionate and tender-hearted. Tender as he was tender. Loving as he was loving. Compassionate as he was compassionate. And love begins to dominate my every action so that everything is, is just a reflection of love. Peace is love resting in its Lord. Bible study, oh, that's just reading a love letter from my lover. Prayer, it's communing with my lover in a very intimate way. Hatred of sin, that's just despising those things that would take me away from my lover. Oh, that's love expecting. Patience, that's love waiting. Love is revolutionary and it revolutions... It Creates a revolution in my heart towards everything. Revolutionizes all of my concepts. That's the word I wanted. Love is democratic. It sees everybody alike. It doesn't play favorites. It loves without distinction. Love is practical. It looks for something to do. As Paul defines love, <clears throat> the love of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, he uses nine things in defining the fruit of God's Spirit. There is one th fruit, that is love. There are eight descriptions of that love. The first three have to do with emotions. That is, the inner working of love within my own heart. And it is love, joy, and peace. This is what love does within me. This is how it affects me emotionally. It brings me joy. It brings me peace. But, outwardly, the next thing, six things that Paul mentions are things whereas love is manifested or demonstrated in an outward way. And it is demonstrated in long suffering, in gentleness in goodness, in faithfulness, in meekness, and in self-control. This is the outworking of love. The inworking is in the emotions, joy, and peace. The outworking. As I relate to others, I become much more long-suffering, much more patient, kind, good, faithful. And that last one, self-control, that's a whole area in itself. When Paul defined this love in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul defined it, first of all, in several negatives. Here's what it doesn't do. It envies not. It boasts not. It's not puffed up. It's not unseemly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. But from the positive standpoint, he gives us four things. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things and it endures all things. Love is the final test of the Christian life. 
By this sign, men know that you're his disciples, and by this sign, you know that you've passed from death into life. Now it is God's desire that his love comes flooding forth from you to others. Have you ever seen a flood? I can remember the flood of 1938. (laughs) You weren't even born then, were you? I was living in Ventura. And my father drove me out to see the flood. We drove out towards Ojai. There was a little stream out there where during the summertime we often used to wade. We'd fish in the stream. We dammed it up and we made swimming pools and we would swim in that gentle little stream. But that little stream had turned into a torrent. It was a raging torrent. It was roaring down this canyon. I could hear the roar of it. And it was rolling huge boulders. It had uprooted large trees and they were being carried in that flood. Crashing into the bridge. And I watched it as one tree smashed into the bridge and the bridge shivered and the bridge fell and began to float away or be pushed downstream. Raging torrent that could not be stopped raging down through that canyon. I was awed as a child watching that. Overawed. It planted a memory in my mind that I could never erase. I've never seen such a raging torrent of water. Uprooting things in its path, moving things away, digging out a deeper channel and even changing channels in places. Finding a new path towards the ocean. That's the word that Jesus used when he talked about how the love of God through the Spirit was to flow forth from your life like a torrent. Moving everything that gets in its path that might stand in its way, that might be a burial rolling over, pushing aside, overlooking, just flowing. God's love, God's Spirit, just flowing, overflowing as it comes forth from my life. We will find that as God's Spirit works in us, empowers us that every one of our natural faculties will be brought to their highest pitch. Whatever God has endowed me to do naturally will be fine-tuned and I will be able to do it better than I have ever been able to do it before. My abilities will be keener, sharper. My mind will be sharper. As God's Spirit fine-tunes the natural faculties. And God always uses those natural faculties because He's the one that placed them there to begin with. And God takes the natural capacities, the natural talents that He has given to you Now when they are turned and dedicated to Him, they always find their highest expression when under the control of the Spirit, used in glorifying God. It is always a tragedy when man takes those natural capacities that God has given and prostitutes them for his own glory or for his own profit But it's always blessed when a man will take those capacities, innate abilities that God has given him, dedicate them to God, and let them find their highest expression 
in bringing glory and praise unto God. God wants every one of you, without exception, to be filled with His Spirit. God wants to work in every one of your lives, drawing you into a closer, more intimate relationship with Himself. God wants to work within each of you. That work of His Spirit conforming you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, in order that God might flow through you His Spirit and His love flooding forth from your life, bringing life to a dying world. When Moses had gathered the 70 men before the Lord that they might receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit to enable them to help him govern over the people. And as the 70 were gathered together there in the tabernacle, and as the Spirit of God came down upon them, And they began under the anointing of the Spirit to prophesy. Someone came in and they said, Lord, Moses, there there are a couple fellows there out in the camp prophesying under the Spirit. And Joshua said, Oh, my Lord, Moses, shall I go out and stop them? And Moses said, Oh, no, I wish to God that every one of them were prophets and the Spirit of God was upon each of them. Oh, what a camp this could be if everyone had this flowing of God's Spirit coming forth from their life. I look tonight and I think of what would happen in Orange County if every one of us had God's Spirit flooding forth from our life like a torrent of living water. I think of what it would do to this county, to this area. I read of some of Finney's revivals and that moving of God's Spirit in the hearts of the people. Many of the areas where Finney held his meetings after he left, every bar in the city closed. Not because there were pickets in front of it. There were just no patrons. And I just think of what God could do. You know, we figure out ways by which we might stem the tide of evil and let's get together and let's, you know, form this coalition and let's, you know, do this and do that and the other hey, let's all yield our lives to the full control of God's Spirit. Let's all be anointed with the Spirit and the power of God and you'll be amazed what God will do just through His Spirit-anointed vessels as He pours forth His power and His love on this thirsty, needy world. We don't have to make signs and go out and pick it. We need to flow in God's love and let God's love flow forth from us. God wants it. And God knows for me personally, I want it. I want God's power and God's Spirit to flow forth from my life. He might use me to touch the needy world around me. It takes Chuck off the throne and the Spirit coming in. I want that. I want purity. 
I want to be holy. I want to be an instrument that God can use to touch this needy part of the world where I live. God help me. God help you. In Jesus' name. Father, we come before you this evening presenting our bodies to you that they might be the instruments, Lord, through which you might work. We present our lives to you that you might first do your work in us, transforming into the image of Jesus. And that that inworking of the Spirit might find its outworking as we relate to others through the love of Jesus Christ. Spirit of God, Descend upon our hearts and upon our lives. Fill us till we overflow. Until it flows like a river of living water. Until it gushes like a torrent, like a flood. uprooting all that would stand in its way, carrying it off in that flood of love. In Jesus' name. Amen. It is interesting, so often when we talk of power and the desire for power, we think of uh, Zortan or uh, He-Man or something, you know, where I can shazam anybody who's in my way, you know, power to love. The power of love that will break down every barrier of resistance. We'll just overflow it. Sweep it aside. That's real power. That's the kind of power I want. May God anoint your life with his spirit in a greater measure than you've ever experienced before, transforming you, your desires, your interest, bringing you into a new relationship with him, deeper, fuller, richer. That your life might indeed become an instrument in God's hands. That your life may may be his channel through which his love touches the world around you. God bless you. May this be a week of knowing the power of God working in your life. In Jesus' name. May the Lord richly bless you as you continue to study his word. If you'd like further information on tapes or a free catalog, contact The Word for Today, P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628.